worship the Lord your God and serve him only. One aspect of worshiping God is stewardship uh, that has an, a component related to financial giving, but stewardship is much more than that. Uh, in that chorus that Nikolai uh, just was leading us in, were the whole realm of nature mine, that would still be far too small a gift. We give our time, we give our talents, we give our prayers, we give our love, we give our earn it, we give our energy to others. These are all acts of worship. These are all acts of love, loving God, but also loving our neighbor as ourselves. As we do have a time of offering uh, today, our brother in the Lord, Heidi, is going to actually offer the prayer on our behalf. Heidi, Heidi, I will turn the microphone to you. Thank you so much, Pastor Head. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Lord, we thank you for yet another opportunity to come before your throne of grace this morning, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, we thank you because it's another opportunity to remember the triumphant entry of your son into Jerusalem. It's another opportunity to reflect on the death of his son, Jesus, of your son, Jesus Christ, and to reflect on how he changed our lives. Lord, we give you the glory, we give you the honor and the adoration. And dear Father, we come before you this morning with a sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise. All the financial gifts that you've bestowed upon us. As a token of our appreciation, we present them before you this morning. We ask that you, Lord, would bless them. And it will become a sweet smell and savor unto you as we present them this morning. Dear Father, we're thanking you for all those that could give and all those that couldn't. Because we are trusting in you that you are the source of our wealth. You are the source of our existence. And you will continue to provide for us immensely. And we're lifting up the rest of the service before you this morning. We present the pastor before you. We ask that even as he leads us into your word, you will open the heavens unto us, that we may receive from you per minute per time. For your word says, the entrance of your word giveth light and understanding unto the simple. We ask for that understanding this morning. It may be the word for just one person, but we ask that our hearts will be prepared to receive it and it will change our lives for good. And dear Father, we pour yourself unto you this morning. We ask that you will fill us in, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may continue to dwell and abide in you. Lord will lift up all those that may be that they may be seeking of one thing or the other from you, trusting in you. We ask that you, Lord, will meet them at the very point of their needs in Jesus' name. Thank you, dear Father, for answering our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for accepting all the sacrifices of grace. Thank you, Lord, for accepting the token of appreciation we've brought before you this day. We ask that you will continue to bless us immensely. For in Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you. Over to you, Pastor Ed. Thank you very much, Heidi. And thank everyone who's been helping us so faithfully financially during these days. We do appreciate it. We know that part of the pandemic has meant that many people have had to learn new things, including how to give financially online, and we are very appreciative for those who have done those things. Uh, today, as we go to our sermon, uh, 
please, I, I repeat this time and time again, please make sure that you have your own copy of scripture. And I would also add that especially with today's sermon, with today's message, it would be very helpful for you to have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. There are so many things that are going to be mentioned today. And hopefully the Lord's Holy Spirit will guide us during this time. And perhaps there will be a phrase today that will be very significant in your life. So in addition to having your Bible, please also find a piece of paper, a, a pen, a pencil that you can write a note for yourself. You know, there are some times in our lives that we know it's going to be a special day. We, we know when we're going to graduate from high school, oh, that's going to be a special day. When we get married, oh, we know that that's going to be a special day. When we're told in advance that we're going to be given a new position in our company and that we're going to be promoted and it's going to happen on a certain day, there are some times that we know that they're going to be a very important day in our life. There are other times that we have no idea how important that day is going to be. A college student who has applied for 12 different jobs because he needs a job and the very last place he puts in an application to is for a shoe store. And it turns out to be one of the most important days of his life because not only did he learn so much in university, but but he learned so much as he worked through his college years at a local shoe store or somebody who was riding a bus in a crowded city and they happen to look across the way. It's They've ridden that same bus so many times, but on that particular day, oh, 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 they saw the person that would become their life partner. There are so many days that we have no idea this is going to be such an important day in our life. Today, as we look at fulfilling God's purpose in your life, in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, we're going to look at lessons from the most important week of history. And it begins with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. If you have your own copy of scripture, look at Matthew chapter 21, and then later today, just go through each of those chapters. You don't have to read it word by word, but just look at all of the things that happened during this most important week of history. There's a lady named Mary Fairchild. <clears throat> you might also want to go to a website and just type in uh, the timeline of the last week of Christ and Mary Fairchild. You see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they record the events, but each one records the events just a little bit differently. But Mary Fairchild, she brings them together. And so, for instance, today, day one is Palm Sunday that we're going to read about very specifically. That's the triumphal entry. But then tomorrow, Monday, we see Jesus clears the temple on, on the third day. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives on Wednesday of this most important week. He has a rest day on Thursday. There is the Passover. And then ultimately, as we go into Friday, his trial, his arrest, his, excuse me, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion on Friday, Saturday, Jesus in the tomb. But then on Sunday, as he, as he rises from the tomb and he sees Mary Magdalene and he sees Peter. Now, he also meets two people. There are two disciples. One is named. His name is Cleopas, and the other is unnamed. But these two men are, are going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 55, about this. Now, have you ever been in a situation where somebody says, Hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about the news? Did you read the latest thing? Did you see the, the latest update? Have, have you heard about this? Or have you also been involved in a situation that you didn't realize who you were talking to? One of my, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Kenneth Chafin, he was invited to speak 
uh, at a luncheon meeting of business people. And it was at a very nice uh, uh, hotel setting and had a very nice ballroom. And as he went to that place to, to speak at the, at the luncheon meeting, he was riding on the elevator with someone else. And he, and he saw that the person had the same kind of name, pad, name badge that they were attending that luncheon. And he asked the person, he said, oh, these luncheons, what happens at these luncheons? And the person explained, oh, about once a month, we get together, we have a lot of speakers come in. It's, it's a very nice time. <clears throat> and my professor, Dr. Chafin, was going to be the speaker that day. And he said to this man, uh, are the speakers very good? And the man said, well, you know, sometimes the speakers are good, sometimes the speakers are not so good, but you can always count on the dessert. The dessert is always good. And, and so my professor, Dr. Chapin, as he walked into the crowded room throughout, through, throughout the, the hour long luncheon, he kind of kept his eye on where that man was seated. And as he was introduced and as he stood to speak at the podium, he said, well, I've heard about the speakers. I've heard that sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good, but at least we know that dessert is always going to be good. Well, you see in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 55, there are these two men, Cleopas is named, and, the other, and Jesus on, on the first resurrection Sunday, he's walking with them and he's asking them. And Cleopas turns and says, are you the only visitor who does not, to Jerusalem, who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Can you imagine being the person who turned to Jesus and saying, don't you even know what happened there? And then Jesus talks with these men as they're on that seven mile, they're on that 12 kilometer walk. And he explains to them so many things. Well, the most incredible week of human history, uh, beginning today, Palm Sunday, we do want to focus on what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And we want to think about how we can apply principles in these scriptures to our own lives. The Bible says this, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. One of the very first things that we see in this scripture, it's, it's twofold. There is absolutely the fulfillment of prophecy. Hundreds of years earlier, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, had made this prophecy. But involved in this prophecy is something that we might too quickly overlook. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, there were laws about the kings of Israel, how they were to govern. And one of those laws was that they were not supposed to acquire horses. Now, to you and I, that might seem a little bit strange. But if we think about it for just a moment, it becomes very clear to us, even to this day, Military might is a strength power symbol around the world. In modern times, in December 17, 1903, there were two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright. And on December 17, 1903, there was the first airplane flight recorded in human history. In just a little over a decade, just about, well, what would it be, 15 years later, excuse me, 11 years later, on July 28th, 1914, World War I began. 
And for the first time in human history, there was a new element of warfare. What was it? It was the airplane. And to this day, what is one of the symbols of power that countries demonstrate? It is their power, their might, when it comes to their air force, their air superiority. Back in the time of the Bible, it was horses and chariots. And God spoke to his people and he said, your kings are not supposed to be like all the other kings. You are not supposed to acquire horses because I am going to be the one who delivers you. You're not going to say, oh, look, it's because of our horses. It's because of our chariots that we have succeeded. It is because you rely upon me, the God of gods, the king of kings. And so in Jesus fulfilling this prophecy, he fulfilled perfectly that he understood his role and as he entered, he didn't come in on a mighty stallion, but not only did he fulfill the spiritual promises, but also the practical things of demonstrating humility. As we go on to Matthew chapter 21, verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Verse 9, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, the people in that day, they understood exactly what the word Hosanna means. Hosanna in the Hebrew language is related to save, rescue, our Savior. In Psalm 118, verse 25, in the English Standard Version, it says, save us. We could say, Hosanna, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And the people recognizing who Jesus was... <laughs> as best as they could. They were celebrating him coming in. He was the long expected Messiah. Now his kingdom was going to be different than any of them could imagine. But nonetheless, as they recognized him as the coming Messiah, they took those palm branches, they took their very cloaks, they spread them on the road. And we can picture similar events happening today when there's a special parade and there's special uh, sometimes confetti that comes down. Or even when we go to a wedding, it's very common for there to be little girls who have little rose petals. And before the bride comes down some, in, some, in some cultures, these little girls, they will sprinkle petals all, all along the pathway that the bride can enter in. In this symbolic way, as Jesus is coming in, showing humility, but as the people are recognizing, this is the one who can save us now. They thought it was going to be a political monarchy that was coming in. They thought that Jesus was going to restore all the political uh, success to the nation. He was ushering in the kingdom, but it was far different than they could possibly imagine. Going on to verse 10, it says, And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. What are some things for you and I to consider as we read this story, as we think about this upcoming week? Number one, knowing God's purpose for your life is so important. In Psalm chapter 100, verse 3, the Bible says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 
You are created for a purpose. You are not just an accidental result of biological and chemical factors. God created every person in this world, and there is a purpose for your life. And in Jesus, as we start today and as we think this upcoming week about the different events, Jesus also submitted to God's purpose in his own life. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, part of this upcoming week will be the night that Jesus was praying in the garden. He was in such agony and such suffering that some of scripture accounts say that he was having drops of blood instead of sweat that were coming from him. And yet in knowing God's purpose for his life, he was also submitting to God's purpose in his life. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, he was praying and he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We need to know God's purpose in our lives, and we need to submit to God's purpose in our lives. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul goes on to verse 3 and says, for, the, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Such an important verse, verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. With this background, again, Paul is demonstrating that we are created. We are not just accidentally here, that there is a purpose for our lives. And that purpose is to fulfill God's will in our lives. And as he has created each of one, uniquely created each of us for a purpose, Paul then goes on in verse 6 and says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. We are called to use the gifts that God has given to us. Oh, you know, God has given such people a beautiful singing voice. And that singing voice is a gift from God. But do they use that voice? merely to become super rock and roll singers? Or do they use that voice to praise God? Some people have the gift of medical knowledge. They can become doctors and surgeons. And yes, that's an element of prestige. But we so admire those who use the gifts that they have from God to help others. There are others who have the gift of service. They never have the title. They never have the prestige. But oh, how we appreciate what they do for us in such practical ways. The, the Bible says, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, verse 7, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Knowing God's purpose in our life, submitting to God's purpose in our life, fulfilling what God has for us to do. We see all of those things demonstrated in the life of Jesus highlighted in this upcoming week. Yes, 
Today is the day of celebration. Today is the day of partially understanding what Jesus can do. But as the week unfolds, he fulfills perfectly all of the prophecies, all of the commandments, and he continues to follow the will of his father, not merely his own desires. Two other things for you and I to consider. Experiencing the refining processes in our life and experiencing God's victory in our life. How is that happening for you this day? How are you experiencing the refining processes in your life? Suffering is a very difficult situation. It hurts, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. And when someone is suffering, when they are experiencing pain, there can be such intense feelings of loneliness. But the scripture reminds us in Psalm chapter 56, verse 8, that God puts our tears in a bottle. They're, they're not ignored. God knows the suffering of his dear children, and those tears are even collected in a bottle. In Psalm 56, verse 8, we read that. Going to Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, on the other hand, we're also told that the day is going to come, that God's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there's going to be no more pain, and there's going to be no more suffering. And there's going to be no more sorrow. And in James chapter 1, in recent weeks, as we went section by section, we reminded ourselves that we are to count it all joy, even when we go through various trials. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and following, Paul reminds us that suffering produces endurance. And in Romans 8, 28, Paul says to us that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Are all things good, meaning are all things pleasant? Are all things enjoyable? No, of course not. Are we alone in the midst of our pain? No, we are never alone. Our Savior himself demonstrated for us what it was like to suffer, his own tears, his own sweat becoming drops of blood. It was so intense. But somehow in these refining processes in our life, God is going to work good, not only for ourselves, but for others as we go through even the most difficult situations in life. And as we experience God's victory in our life, oh, not only is today Palm Sunday, but next Sunday, Easter Sunday, <laughs> as Jesus raises from the dead, as he conquers death and sin, as we see God's victory demonstrated in the life of Jesus, there are other theologians and they talk about the five crowns of scripture. Now, <laughs> there's a popular game, a card game. Maybe you've played it recently. It's also called, called Five Crowns. So for you, for those of you that are taking notes and you are going to check out what Pastor Ed says and you are going to go to the internet, don't look up the five, five Crowns card game, okay? Look up the Five Crowns, okay, of Christian theology <laughs> or look at the Five Crowns of biblical teaching, okay, when you go back and, and do your research later this week. There is the crown of life. Again, James tells us that in James chapter 1, verse 12. There is an imperishable crown in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And we've mentioned in previous weeks that in the time of Corinth, Back in the time of Paul, athletes would compete for a crown, but that crown was made out of celery. And in the hot, hot sun of ancient Greece, that celery 
That's what the that's what the athlete competed for. And yet, as soon as they got that crown of celery, very quickly it passed away. In contrast to that, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, we have an imperishable crown. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, there is the crown of righteousness. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, there is a crown of glory. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, there is a crown of rejoicing. When we go to the book of Revelation in chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, there are the 24 elders, and they are taking their crowns, and they're laying them down before the throne of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. As you experience the refining processes in your life, also remember that God's victory is declared in your life. Even if it doesn't feel that way. Even even if the pain and suffering seems overwhelming, God is creating a crown, a crown in your life that in your ultimate victory, you will be able to present back to him as you lay it at his feet, declaring him to be the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So <clears throat> as we go through this next week, here are some questions for each of us to answer. Number one, what do you personally need to do to accept and submit to God's purpose for your life? Have you followed God's purpose in your life? You're not here just accidentally, as the book of Romans and other scriptures teach us. You are created for a purpose. Are you submitting to that purpose in your life? Number two, what act of humility do you need to demonstrate? Christ himself on this triumphal entry, he fulfilled prophecy, but he also demonstrated humility. What would it mean for you this week to demonstrate humility? Number three, what is the purpose of suffering in your life? It doesn't take the pain away, but, it's, but it does have a purpose. And as you think about it, what is God creating in your life for his glory? And then number four, what is the victory you need to claim? Not arrogantly, not pridefully, but as a child of God, what victory is he preparing in your life this week? These two men on the road to Emmaus had no idea that they were talking to Jesus. But on the very first Resurrection Sunday, they learned more and more. You and I today, as we're at the very beginning of that process on Palm Sunday, may we read God's word, may we apply God's word, and may we live God's word in this upcoming week of our lives. Nikolai, if you'll lead us once more in a song.
dishonored itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within. To the way things appear, you look into my heart. I'm coming back to water and wash. And it's all about you. And it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. through this upcoming week, I encourage you to make three commitments in your life. Number one, make the commitment to study the Bible with someone every week. Make sure, yes, that you're reading the Bible on your own, but also make sure that you find at least one other person to study the Bible with every week. Number two, make sure you pray with someone each week, similar to reading the Bible, of course, we also pray individually, but it's so important for us to reach out and to pray with others. And number three, as it's within your power to do so, bless one person each week. Who is someone that you can call if it's appropriate and if it's safe to do so? Who's someone that you could perhaps even visit in person? There are many, many ways to bless a person each week. But let's make sure that we continue to make a commitment to do these three things. There are some community announcements that we want to remind you of. Please, uh, our main way of keeping in track with people is through our church uh, emailing list. Please go to our website, uh, www.ibcbudapest.org. Please give us your updated contact information and press that submit button so that we can write to you. Also, if you do use Facebook, please like our Facebook page and recommend it to others. There are other activities that are taking place throughout the week. Uh, as we lead up to uh, Easter Sunday, there are a series of online devotionals they're by a man named Andrew Murray. They're called The Secret of the Cross. There are daily readings, again, in that newsletter. We can get you that. 
every Sunday, there is a children's time at 10.05. Uh, the children today were talking about obedience. It, it was one of the great moments because there's in the in the children's time, there, there was the question, well, do you always obey your parents? And, and, and the answer was, uh, not always. <laughs> I mean, it was it was so it was so real about all of our lives. So, uh, and the Bible went on, of course, to explain how we need to be obedient. So, please consider checking in for the children's time, even if you're not a child. It's a very profitable time. There is discipleship training. Numerous groups are taking place, and our dear brother in the Lord Hernando is leading. Uh, also today will be the Young Adults Bible Study online. It's for people that are between 18 and 30-ish. It's not a hard, fast rule, but that's online today. Today we'll be continuing the book of Mark, uh, thinking how we can uh, share our faith better with others as we read the, the gospel of Mark. Today will be Mark chapter 9. There's also a prayer time every Tuesday online at 7 p.m., and there's a women's Bible study every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, once a month, our ladies have an event called Connected in Christ. Yesterday, uh, March 27th, I heard the reports. It was a wonderful time that the ladies came together hearing testimonies, sharing in times of worship, of prayer, of singing, and also hearing about people that are helping those that are uh, desperately in need. There's also a business fellowship that takes place on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. There's something called the Right Now Media that uh, we all have an ability to have an access to that. Now, today is the last Sunday of the month, and as such, we get to celebrate anyone having a birthday or an anniversary in the month of March. Now, this is where I need your help. There are so many different screens and I'm not seeing everyone, okay? I, I can't physically see everyone like, like if we were there in person, okay?